Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Tia Kiliak. Welcome to What's Up Doc, a monthly lecture program of the Concord Hospital Trust. We would like to take this time to recognize and to thank the Walker Lecture Series for their generous sponsorship of What's Up Doc. The Walker Lecture Series was established here in Concord in 1892. It came from the bequest of the will of Abigail Walker. Per the terms of Ms. Walker's will, the Walker Series offers lectures on history, literature, art, and science, as well as musical, dramatic, and literary performances. All events are free to the public and are held at the Concord City Auditorium. We encourage you to check out their website at walkerlecture.org to view their calendar and programs. We have a wonderful program for you today. Our guest physician is Dr. Alexandru Vida. Dr. Vida's topic is surgical lung care, what's new at Concord Hospital. Dr. Vida joined Concord Hospital in 2018. Following medical school, Dr. Vida completed his residency at the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine, and then he went on to complete a fellowship at Ohio State University Medical Center. Dr. Vida is board certified in surgery, as well as thoracic and cardiac surgery. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vida. Oh. You're kind. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank, thank you, Tia. Good, good afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, having me. Um, as I said, Mihai Vida, thoracic surgery. Um, it's my uh, second time um, uh, presenting at this, uh, this meeting, at this uh, Friday afternoon, a WhatsApp doc. The first time was in September of 19. I saw that. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to closer? So the first time I presented at this meeting was uh, this uh, event was September of 2019. So we're almost two and a half years uh, uh, since, since that, and uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you for having me again here. Um, a lot of things obviously happen in two and a half years, uh, both in the world and, and here at the hospital. Uh, the first, um, when, when I was approached to, uh, to do this, uh, the, the title proposed was uh, lung cancer, talking about lung cancer. And certainly we'll, we'll talk a little bit of lung cancer, but I felt... Uh, looking back at uh, two and a half years, that a lot of new things happened um, in our department uh, at a hospital, and I thought it would be a good opportunity for me to talk a little bit, uh, not only about lung cancer, but all the other things that we're doing in our department, uh, division uh, within cardiothoracic surgery, thoracic specifically, uh, for uh, you, for our patients, for our community. So um, it's not going to be just lung cancer, although we will uh, talk about uh, Fan, fan favorite lung cancer a little bit. Um, please stop me at any point in time. You have questions. You know, I like to make it as interactive as less dry as possible. So, um, so, but yeah, we do have slides. Uh, you know, ask a surgeon to give a presentation or show up with 12, 12 slides or twenty. Not that many, but still. So, as I said, we'll talk a little bit about lung cancer. Um, it, it's still around, and uh, before. Um, this pandemic that we're in right now is hopefully done with it in the next, God, months or a year or so. If you were to go to the WHO website and dig a little bit, you'll figure out that lung cancer was classified as a epidemic, even, you know, years back. And it is a global epidemic. Um, the most recent data from the U.S., you know, quotes around 160,000 deaths just from lung cancer a year. Um, it's more than breast, prostate, and colon cancer put together. And um, there are sobering, those are sobering numbers. Um, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot of lung cancer. And um, of, there are always a lot of numbers, statistics associated with lung cancer. So I'm not going to give you a lot of them, but I'm just going to touch upon the ones I think are more, more important or more sort of like sobering, if you would. Um, 15%, I have patients come in and say, Doc, I have lung cancer. I never smoked in my life. How come? Well, 15% of lung cancers are found in patients who never smoked. So it, it does, it does happen. It's, it's, not a, it's not a small percentage. And one of the main reasons why it pops up in, in um, 
and these are two graphs. Unfortunately, I'm not sure why the colors are, you know, I had in my, or my slides are nice red and blue and whatnot, but um, this here, this graph here shows the five-year survival for prostate cancer, breast, and lung. And you have 100% for prostate, almost like, what, 90% for breast, and only 15, barely 16% for, for lung. And this is all commerce, you know, all stages of lung cancer, and same for, for prostate and for breast. So still, you know, a, a, a deadly, deadly disease, obviously. And then down here, we have percentage of cancers found before they metastasize. For prostate, 90% of the prostate cancer are found before they metastasize, the before they spread, sort of. And then a breast is 60%, and for, as I quoted, for lung, only 16%. So um, it's, 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 a, it's a hard disease to, to, uh, to deal with. But m common factors, right? Smoking, then secondhand exposure to smoke. But the one that I want to talk about more, because we live in, in New Hampshire, in the Granite State, it's a radon, a radon basically exposure to, to radon. And radon is basically the leading cause of um, lung cancer in non-smokers, and it's a uh, second cause, leading cause overall. And it's interesting because I moved here from Ohio, and there's radon everywhere, but there's more here than any other state that I'm, that I'm aware of, just because of the geological um, situation here with the granite and so forth. But sort of like a funny story, I was in Ohio, and uh, uh, we used to have this commercial in uh, southern Ohio on TV. There was this guy on a horse basically uh, running around the, the screen, and uh, he had a service of measuring, basically radon measuring in your house, and said, I'll come to your house and measure radon in your, in your base, basement. You'll never know what, how much you have. And it's interesting, I don't see this here. I don't, think, I don't see this very much popularized or like, you know, um, people don't know. I have a radon mitigation system in my house. You know, there, there's a, a lot of this around. And um, it's, um, it's a second leading cause of lung cancer. So um, here, you know, lung cancer caused, so death by lung cancer caused by radon, just third after leukemia and lymphoma. So it's, it's a significant uh, uh, factor. This is a little map, and again, on my slide, I'm sorry, I'm not sure why, but this would be this dark, you know, gray is actually red. So this is the state of New Hampshire, and these are um, areas that the dark ones would be areas with the highest radon sort of concentration or emission, if you would. Uh, followed by yellow, and then green, I mean, this light blue will be the, the lowest. So it's a, it's a significant amount of radon. And this next slide shows um, actual, actual date measurements. So they got in people's basements, and basically they measured. Uh, and actually, uh, the darker the blue, the worse, the, the higher the, the level of radon that they actually measured in, in basements in people's uh, houses and homes. So there's a, there's a fair amount of radon here. Uh, fresh air, but also radon. So um, the only cure for, for lung cancer is surgical resection. No matter, you know, that's the only cure. Removing it with lymph nodes and getting a good result, that's the only cure. Uh, you can have chemo, you can have radiation, those are treatments, but in terms of curing it, surgical resection is the only, the only way. And then, um, as I mentioned, only a third of all the cancers are found are before you can, before they metastasize, before they uh, are at advanced stage, where actually you can offer them a uh, surgical resection with, with good results. And the other options are chemo and radiation therapy. They help. They work. So in terms of what's new here at Concord Hospital, I remember when I was here in September, I, um, I presented a similar slide to this. I said, this is what we're heading towards, and we are there, you know, two years into it, a year and a half into it, basically. Um, we were able to uh, get the, the newest generation uh, robot, the Vinci robot for, for surgery. I'm not the only department using it, obviously. Urology, uh, general surgery, um, OBGYN uh, use, use this. But this is a wonderful tool uh, that uh, allows um, uh, us to perform lung cancer surgery with very small incisions. Patients get a total of four or five incisions like this big on the side of the chest. Um, they stay in the hospital two, two or three days versus four or five with a bigger incision. Uh, pain is much less, recovery is much faster, they get back to work much faster or to their golfing or gardening, uh, whatnot. 
and it's a, it's a wonderful tool. Um, so this is something that we achieved, and I'm very uh, proud and happy and um, thankful to the administration for moving forward and, and giving us this, uh, this, this tool. Um, the other thing that um, uh, you'll see a few slides here about uh, new techniques, new to us, techniques that as a thoracic surgeon I would like to and I wanted and I did bring over here to our hospital. Um, and this is uh, uh, the, the, what I, uh, what I um, love about thoracic surgery is that as I move to my fellowship, you, the fellowship is mixed. You do open heart surgery and general thoracic surgery and I, I enjoy general thoracic surgery more because of its diversity. You can do uh, uh, as invasive surgery as you want, uh, cutting skin, uh, uh, big incisions or small incisions, but you also have the opportunity of doing other procedures that are not, that do not involve cutting skin. Uh, for example, the photodynamic therapy uh, basically is, uh, involves inserting a, uh, a laser fiber, and I apologize, it doesn't project very well, but you see there's a, this is a, 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 a glass fiber that is connected to a laser and it emits a specific uh, uh, light on a specific wavelength and you introduce this through a bronchoscope into the patient's airway where there is a, a tumor, a cancer, and you're able to basically deliver a treatment um, uh, debulking and cleaning up the airway and basically killing the tumor in place there without surgery. This is directed towards patients who cannot have surgery, who uh, need this to be open in order to have chemotherapy. It's more like a palliation, but it's a, it's a wonderful tool that um, uh, I was able to bring over here to the hospital and I'm encouraging, you know, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists to refer patients to us so we can have this treatment. It's, it's used both for cancers inside the airways and also cancers inside the uh, esophagus for the same purpose of uh, opening up the airway and uh, killing some of the tumor and, and uh, opening up the airways and the, and the airway and the um, esophagus. Uh, to my knowledge, you are the only center in New Hampshire that are offering this treatment. Otherwise, in order to get this, you have to go to Boston and, or further, further south. Um, as I said, it's used both for lung and esophageal cancer. And um, it is part of the I know multidisciplinary is a, is a term that, you know, it's used very easily or cheaply, if you would, but truly this is part of a multidisciplinary uh, uh, approach to lung and esophageal cancer. So for lung, it's the pulmonologist, it's the medical oncologist, the radiation oncologist, it's myself, radiologist, uh, and same for esophageal cancer with the gastroenterologist. The, the patients are seen by, initially by a medical oncologist, and they feel that, and they're presented ideally in our tumor board. We meet every Thursday, um, except for one, the first Thursday in a month, and we discuss uh, patients that, um, that we need an opinion, we need a consensus, we need uh, to pull, put our heads together and figure out what will be the best uh, uh, treatment option for the patient. So uh, that will be the uh, photodynamic therapy. And this is also an achievement. It's something that I did bring here. We have it available here. Uh, looking uh, also at lung cancer, the other system or process that we have in place is the lung cancer screening program. These are the um, qualifiers, age-wise, history of smoker, either current or quit, how much. And patients are enrolled in the, uh, in the lung cancer screening program and do receive a yearly low-dose CAT scan. Um, for surveillance. If any of the scans can show any abnormality, then they will they get switched to a normal, regular CAT scan, if you would, and then they, they end up being seen closer by pulmonologist or by us or by medical oncology. And again, this feeds into that multidisciplinary approach to, to lung cancer. Again, it's the pulmonary team, it's the medical oncology team, the radiation oncology team, uh, primary care physicians uh, have the option of, of driving this if so they, they, they choose. So that's a, that's a, good, uh, a good program to have. Um, along the lines of what other procedures um, we can do as, as thoracic surgeons that do not necessarily involve cutting the skin, and that's again something that I enjoyed and, and attract, made, me, made thoracic surgeons feel attractive to me, is um, navigational bronchoscopy. Basically, it's, um, it's a bronchoscopy where you place a endoscope inside the airway and you get inside the patient's uh, airways in a lung, left, uh, right, or, or, or left lung. But what's special about navigation bronchoscopy is the fact that you um, use a software that would basically 
create or generate a pathway through the airways to whatever lesion that you want to get in the chest, in the lung, and either biopsy or drain or get some tissue from. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's kind of like your, your GPS in your car when you want to go from Concord, from Concord Hospital to uh, uh, Boston, and you put, you put your, your navigation, you put your data there, I want to go to uh, you know, a good Italian restaurant in the, in the north end of Boston, or whatnot, or south end, and then it will, it will take you there. That's this blue line that it will take, uh, it will guide us as we're doing, uh, as we're in the operating room and a patient is asleep, it will guide us virtually through the virtual airways that are basically reproduced on the screen, and then you, you as a, as a, as a, as a surgeon, look on the screen and you, you superimpose this picture here with what you see on the screen in real life as you're advancing the probe. And it gives you the, uh, it tells you how close or how far you are from your, from your target. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, tool that allows us to um, diagnose or deliver treatments to lesions to usually cancers in, in the lung. And again, it's minimally invasive. You come in, you have it done, uh, you go home the same day. Uh, what else? As we're moving into the future, one thing that um, um, I would love to, uh, and we're very close to, we're getting close to bringing it uh, here, is um, endobronchial valves. It sounds, it sounds fancy, but basically what it is, is you see this little, this little metal uh, devices that act literally, as the name says, as a one-way valve. And you'll see there will be, they are introduced in the airways also with a, with a bronchoscope. You deploy them wherever you need them to deploy them in the, in the airways. And what they do basically is if you have a patient that has very bad emphysema with the lung tissues destroyed because of emphysema, smoking, uh, disease, and those patients end up with uh, a collapsed lung because the lung tissue is very thin and diseased, uh, usually, you want to take those patients to the OR and try to patch, if you would, that hole. But sometimes they are so diseased, they are elderly, they have other problems, and the lung tissue is so bad that those um, holes in the lung basically would not heal. Well, dropping these one-way valves into the airways, feeding that, that area of disease, lung tissue, basically will exclude that area of lung from, from breathing and will help with healing and uh, uh, avoid chest tubes and, and a long, long hospitalizations. Again, um, very, um, it's a very uh, simple procedure, um, and it's something that we're very close to bringing, bringing here. Again, and again, it's something that I would work in conjunction with the pulmonary team, with radiology, with uh, 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 the ICU team to, to care for this patient. So this is under the banner of what, what to expect in the future. Um, the other thing that, again, we're moving close to bringing here, this is not a new technique. This is, the stents are somewhat new. I mean, the endobronchial valves are somewhat new, maybe five you know, years or so uh, old, but, um, but the endobronchial stents are not. These are basically um, an older technique, an older uh, uh, thing that it's been available for a while. Again, you'll see um, there are metal, metal stents that are collapsed that also you'll introduce through a bronchoscope into an airway or the esophagus, and um, if you have a cancer here, a tumor, you will introduce, bridge that, and then deploy them. And this is a picture as to how they look once that airway is open. Again, it's used for patients who cannot have surgery for, in order to open up the airway. Let's see if the, if the cancer is here, they need to get chemotherapy, but if the airway is closed, then here is blocked, then they'll get a bad pneumonia in this lung. But if you open it up and the uh, air gets in and uh, drains and aerates the lung, then uh, they will get over their pneumonia and they can tolerate either the radiation or the chemotherapy. This would work in conjunction with, with the photodynamic therapy that I showed earlier. That will, uh, the photodynamic therapy will basically create the channel here that will make this, this opening bigger so you can actually come in and slide this stent in and, and open it up. Um, it's not new, as I said. Um, and we're working on getting back to bringing it here, again, in conjunction with pulmonary medicine, in conjunction with, with, with an anesthesia department here at the hospital. And again, it's a technique that right now we're sending patients to Dartmouth or Boston and so forth. So we'd like to, to, to keep them here and look after them. And uh, this is a picture of a lung of the airway tumor, but the same principle applies for an esophageal tumor, a cancer, esophagus that cannot have surgery. Um, 
The other thing that um, a new technique that I'm, 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 I'm very close to bringing it here is um, um, a technique of minimally invasive fixating refractors. Re 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 so right now, if you have a one or two or multiple refractors, the way they are fixed is by having uh, big incisions on the side of the chest, getting to the chest wall, finding the the uh, the, the fractures from if you from the outside, if you would, and then individually plate them here on the surface. This would be this is, this is the uh, upper this surface, plating them with titanium plates. It works. It works very well. This is how we've been doing it, and for for many years. But uh, there are big incisions. Um, there's a lot of dissection. You end up with a fair amount of blood loss at times, you know, uh, getting there. And um, the patients spend a fair amount of time in a, in a hospital, tubes and drain and so forth. So there's a new technique that, um, again, I'm in the process of bringing over here that will allow us placing plates on the ribs, but from inside the chest. Unfortunately, I, I do have a video that, for whatever reason, doesn't, doesn't work, but I will uh, uh, on, on this. But the way this works is that you um, would put a camera in the patient's chest, which you do anyway for the, for the traditional procedure, if you would, and then you will slide these plates, these titanium plates from the inside, in, inside the chest. You'll uh, guide them through uh, individual holes that you pre-drill into the rib. This is the fracture. Align them, put uh, knots on top of the, of the bolts there, and then you'll end up with a rib that's fixated from the inside instead of from the outside. The advantage of, is that instead of making one big incision on the outside, you make only one small incision and you try to, you, you have access to these fractures from one single incision. Uh, so it's less dissection, less pain, um, much, much faster, much uh, healing, you know, a, a, a process. So this is something that we're in a process of bringing, bringing over here and offering our patients. Uh, next is a video, unfortunately doesn't, I mean, I'll try again, but unfortunately doesn't word it. Basically, this is still here. Um, this is a picture uh, inside the chest. There's a camera inside the chest. This is the chest wall. You can see here, you can kind of appreciate a, a fracture here, if you would. Um, this is the rib, the inside of the chest wall. The lung is down here. Uh, this rib here is already fixated. They, the fracture probably is uh, here, and then the plate from here to down here. One screw, the other screw is down there. And unfortunately, it doesn't work, but the, what a vi this video shows is this other plate coming from inside the chest here through a other small incision that you make through which you put the camera anyway, and then guide it with these two wires through the pre-drill holes, and then uh, uh, get in, in opposition against the, against the chest wall, and basically fixating this uh, rib uh, from the inside ex ex instead of from the outside with a big incision. And you can do, you know, two, three, four ribs, uh, you know, this way. It's an it's a easier procedure. It's a, it's a much better for the patient in terms of uh, invasion. It's minimally invasive. So, and I apologize, this video does not work properly. So, so rib do you take that? No. Out? No. No, very good question. You buy them for life. There's a little <laughs> titanium plates. <laughs> no, they they will not alarm. No, they will they will see you in that. Especially if you go to the big. Uh, my mother calls it the big jar. You know, the the big jar that you have to put your uh, hands up like that. They will see them there, but they're they're used to this. And you can tell them. I have some. Uh, I have some. I went skiing, and I have some uh, some um, uh, rip plates. They're familiar. They they they're good about it. But no, they they do not. It doesn't beep or anything like that. And no, we do not have to take them out. Routinely, if there is a complication we have, but otherwise, no. And again, I apologize for this video not, not working, but um, um, moving forward, there's this um, a little bit older slide, but I, want, I left it here because there are some things that we already, um, something we already did and something that were very close and something that we're still looking in, into, the, into the near future, I hope. Um, we're getting ready to start a lung nodule program here, and this will be different than the um, lung cancer screening program, you know, that it re basically represents a, um, think of a, a large um, safety net over this, or uh, that's supposed to catch all the patients that come into the hospital and have a imaging study, CAT scan, chest x-ray, whatever, for any other reasons, and incidentally, a lung nodule, lung mass is found. 
Um, these patients right now, most of them are lost. They go either back to a primary care physician and they're busy doing other things in terms of following this up or they do not have a primary care physician. They are seen through the ER or they're coming to the hospital service for other issues. So um, this is a way of catching all these patients, um, directing them again through a multidisciplinary uh, center program where myself, medical oncology, radiation oncology, pulmonary medicine, radiology, we sit down, we review these films, and we uh, basically triage this patient and offer them the best, the next best option in terms of either follow-up or uh, diagnosis and making sure that like this we do not miss any potential lung cancers that otherwise will escape the, 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 the system, if you would. And, uh, uh, this patient can come back later with, with a much larger ca uh, cancer or metastasis cancer. So very close to getting this, uh, getting this going. Uh, Chris is working very hard and uh, uh, with the IT folks, so we're, we're very close. Um, this is a much uh, sort of like a, a long-range um, desire of mine. Again, having a multi-modality clinic uh, is something that I found. I, I, I didn't invent this. Uh, big university hospitals have this, the Ohio State, uh, uh, Medical College of Virginia where I trained, uh, where basically they're a one-stop shop, especially now they're going back in person, one-stop shop for patients to come in and uh, have uh, a one visit with a surgeon, a medical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, a pulmonary doctor. And I found that this works very well, especially in a setting like this where we have a lot of patients coming from a big distance, for a larger distance from up north. Uh, all my patients are from up north um, who would rather stop and instead of you coming on today for thoracic surgery and you come in next week or two weeks later for medical oncology and so forth. So there's something that I would love to get everybody at least, you know, once a month and have a few patients that instead of going coming here four times, they'll come in just one time and get an opinion and get a plan from this one uh, visit. And I, as I said, I, I left this slide um, unchanged on purpose because this is something we already achieved. Um, I did start a thoracic surgery clinic in Laconia. It's once a month right now. I can go there more often if we have more patients, but it works very well. And again, I feel that there's a lot of patients that uh, instead of driving an extra, I don't know how many, 20, 30 miles to conquer, they prefer to stop by in Laconia and be seen there. So that's something that we achieved, and uh, I appreciate the help from administration to get this set up. So. Uh, um, and I think that's it. That's all that I have. The only other thing that I wanted to uh, touch base is that um, in September, you know, when 19, uh, it was me and another cardiac surgeon. Now we have, uh, it's me still, and we have two other uh, wonderful open heart surgeons, uh, Nick Francolancia and Dr. Lou Russo. So we're a very good uh, group together, work very well together. We uh, cover each other on calls on, on the weekend. So it's a, it's a very good uh, uh, practice. So um, thank you for, for your time. Questions or thoughts? Questions for Dr. Varga? Go ahead. The radar kit. Are those radon kit, right. Radon. Right. Radon, right. Um, are those things that you, you purchase and then later? No, there is a, I guess you have to have a, a whole radon mitigation. So you have to they have people come in and measure how much radon there is in your basement. There are certain levels and certain like EPA measurements and whatnot. And if it's over a certain level, which probably will be being a New Hampshire and a Granite State, then you have to install a, you have to, it's recommended to install a mitigation kit. It sounds fancy, but what it is is basically they make a hole in a slab I know, of your basement and there's a, a pipe that comes from there and takes the air, whatever, from there and shoots it up uh, onto your roof into the air. So instead of that radiation percolating into your house over years and giving you cancer is just kind of a sucked out and up in the air. Thank you. All Any right. other questions for Dr. Maida? Go ahead. Um, you talked about the uh, detection seems, you know, you're catching lung cancer later in the stage, it seems like 16%. Right. What can be done to detect lung cancer sooner? Very good, very good question, thank you. So, historically, there were no, we knew anecdotally as, as cancer, lung cancer docs, whether medical oncologists or thoracic surgeons, that 
there has to be some way of detecting, of screening for lung cancer, de detecting lung cancer uh, sooner. Issue was historically with the way how you design a study. Let's say you take two smokers and you say, you're going to get CAT scans to see where you get cancer. You're not going to get any CAT scans, uh, the, you know, because in order to see where a study works or not. Well, years back, so it was a hard, it, it was difficult to figure out a way of studying that. So they looked back at the uh, sort of like historical data and they concluded that, well, patients who ended up getting CAT scans were actually found with, were, there was a word detecting. There was, a, there was a advantage in basically screening patients with certain conditions, age, smoking, um, history, stuff like that. So once that was agreed and approved upon, then a system of uh, a program of lung cancer screening was agreed upon. Also, the advent of low-dose CAT scans, so you don't get a lot of radiation once a year. So now we do have this lung cancer screening program that I, that I, I showed in terms of uh, uh, slides where you basically, if you, if you qualify age-wise, smoking history, or in at least this, then you will get you qualify, and it's free through Medicare, Medic, whatever, to get a yearly low-dose CAT scan to screen, to find cancers if they, if something were to pop up during, and you get this, you know, I guess lifetime. So that's the way of doing it right now. The other way to find cancer sooner is what I what I tell, and thanks for your questions. What I tell uh, meetings like this is. What I do see is a fair amount of patients that come in and say, Doc, I started having some shortness of breath and then some discomfort in my chest, and I went to my primary care physician, and I got some antibiotics, then that didn't help, then I got some steroids, and that didn't help, then, then I got a chest x-ray, and it looked a little bit fuzzy, and let's say, let's repeat the chest in three months, and then in three months, it looked even fuzzier, and then I got another, and again, then I got a CAT scan, and the CAT scan will be, is a tool that will tell you that's more accurate. They will, they will find nodules, masses, lesions, things of that nature. So what I, what I suggest, what I tell patients or, you know, I say, you know, if, if it doesn't feel, you know your body best. You know your body better than all the physicians in the world, whether they are Concord Hospital or NYU or Boston or whatever. So you feel something is wrong, just don't say, hey, doc, okay, PCP, what, uh, can I have a cat on my chest? I want to make sure everything is okay. And that's how you find um, lung lesions faster, sooner. That yeah. I, I yeah. It it is working. Um, I don't have any data. I'm not going to make up anything. I, uh, uh, hospitals that have programs like this do catch cancer. So I, I have to assume that the needle is being moved to some extent. What what you know? I'm going to COVID COVID kicked <laughs> kicked out in a, kicked us you know in a, Kick all these programs kind of, nobody wanted to come in in person, nobody wanted to come in in the hospital to get even a, 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 a CAT scan, let alone a visit, you know, uh, in person. So, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't have the data. I'm sure that, I'll, I'll have to look. I'm sure data exists, but I'm, I'm sure that the needle got moved a little bit because it's been going on for a few years now. This, I mean, these programs have been going on for a few years. I would say at least five, five to ten years, maybe like that. Oh, yeah, very good. Ah, sorry, perfect, yes. So um, along the lines of build it and they will come, um, uh, Dr. Mayer, Meyer, right, whom I'm sure you, you guys know or heard of, Joseph Meyer, um, started a, uh, a smoking cessation clinic here at the hospital. And uh, uh, he's doing it right. Uh, and as, as I tell my patients, it's a one-on-one. It's a physician visit. It's not one of those... Uh, they work, but uh, not in one of those uh, AA meetings, group shaming or whatnot. It's a one-on-one -on -one visit, you know. There's a lot of stigma. There's a lot of shame associated to smoking and cancer. And uh, I, I have patients that say, I'll, Doc, I'll quit on my own. I'm, I'm, and I tell them, it's highly unlikely. You, I have patients that start, what, age nine? We had one day in clinic, had two patients start at age nine smoking. And they are like in their 60s or 70s now. So uh, it's, nicotine is very addictive. And it's not nicotine that's going to kill you. It's the tars and all the other stuff in the cigarette in the, that, that will kill you. But nicotine is very addictive. So you won't be able to quit on your own. It's highly unlikely. It's not impossible. It's highly unlikely. So I tell them it's not, it's not a sign of weakness. It's just um, you need help. And this program works very well. Um, we propose them to all our patients kind of on our, uh, when we see patients in clinic on our um, 
almost standard, you know, question now. If you are, the first question is, are you interested in smoking, in quitting smoking? If the answer is yes, then uh, we propose them to uh, to meet with uh, Dr. Mayer, and um, I think it's one of a, a physician assistant that works or nurse that works. And they meet, and the, the feedback that I got, that we got from patients is very good. It works very well, and uh, it's, a, it's a tailored, like the, the, the program. It's not a cookie-cutter approach. You know, everybody's different. And some patients said, well, doc, I tried uh, Wellbutrin and all the other stuff in the past, and nothing worked. I tried uh, patches, and I'm allergic. I, you know, so that's why I said they, they meet one-on-one, -on -one and there's a, um, a tailored approach. It works very well, and the feedback we got from the staff was very good. They were very, um, it was very fulfilling, right, to, uh, to see um, these patients referred to them and people that actually wanted to get better. So it's a, it's a very good, it's a great tool. Thanks for reminding me. I have, to put it on, uh, I have to put it on the slides here, yes. So, yeah, smoking cessation. So if you know anybody that wants to quit smoking, it's, uh, it works very well. That's, that's one of the things that... <clears throat> You know, hospitals have pamphlets, and the state has kick it and quit it and whatever, and you can get, uh, and the primary care physicians are trying, but unless you have a dedicated, um, again, I'm going to use another term, that a physician champion, you know, it's not going to work very well. But thank you for reminding me. It's great. Any other questions for Dr. Bida? Dr. Bida, this has been awesome. Oh, thank you. All the new things and all the things that you want to bring to Concord. There are a few. We're still well. working, right? Yeah, exactly. So we're very fortunate to have you here with us. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the entire Concord Hospital Trust staff, thank you so much for joining us here, for our audience in person, and for those of you who are viewing online. Uh, we hope you will join us next month on Friday, May 13th. Dr. Nicholas LaRochelle, our emergency department medical director, will be here talking about uh, strokes and preventing strokes, secondary strokes for stroke survivors. So uh, Friday, May 13th, wishing everyone a great weekend. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.